first of all, thanks for, uh, thanks for inviting uh, the four of us. And unfortunately, David couldn't make it uh, today. He had all the priorities, actually. He was uh, out fundraising for his next fund, so you can just see that VCs also need to fundraise once in a while. But anyways, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, we um, hope to give you kind of an overview of, the, of what we do and the in kind of the VC um, side of the way that we look at companies, the way we look at opportunities. Um, and the way we, that we work with the companies where we invest. Um, so I think before I get started uh, too much, I will just like to uh, introduce the, the panel for today. So we have Asaf, who's an investment manager with Glenrock out of Israel. We have Gabriel Carvosos, if I pronounce that correctly. Uh, you're at Leering Investment Bank. And then we have Walter Stockinger from uh, Managing Director at Haiti Ventures. So I think, you know, since David isn't here today, I think I have a, kind of a, a dual role. So I'll both do the, the moderation and be a panelist at the same time. But I think uh, I'll save myself towards the end. And then, Esa, if you can uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about Glenrock, what you do, uh, what you focus on, and kind of the geographical coverage and deal flow, et cetera. Excellent. Well, first of all, I'm very happy to be here, of course. Uh, Glenrock is a private investment company investing in startups for the last two decades or so. Uh, mainly in life science, but not only in life science. We had more than a dozen companies listed in the various uh, American stock exchanges throughout the years. Uh, one more notable portfolio company which gained uh, some traction lately was uh, Mobileye, which was acquired by Intel for $15 billion. I've been with Glenrock for the past 12 years. Uh, prior to that, I was a self-entrepreneur, I'm an executive MBA from uh, Kellogg, so I'm more, uh, more of a finance uh, type of guy. And uh, I'll turn to you, uh, Gabriel. Yeah, um, thank you. So I'm also a Kellogg grad uh, from the MBA program, but Gabriel Cavazos, uh, director in the investment banking group at Lyric Partners. Uh, Lyric Partners is not really a household name in Europe yet, but we're very active in the U.S. in terms of taking young companies, uh, healthcare companies, public on the NASDAQ, advising them uh, in, in the context of M&A and partnering. Um, so my background, I started as a, as a scientist, uh, actually at Pfizer, um, 18 years ago. Um, I, it was actually Park Davis, Warner Lambert before the Pfizer acquisition. Uh, spent about eight years in pharma before joining J.P. Morgan's M&A group uh, ten years ago, and Lyric about eight and a half. Uh, so Lyric is a healthcare-dedicated investment bank, uh, full service. We do everything from equity to, to debt to uh, M&A advisory work. Um, and we've probably about five or six years ago recognized that there were, um, you know, the science and the technology in Europe uh, rivaled that of uh, the U.S. and Cambridge and, and Palo Alto and, and the New York-New Jersey corridor, but uh, the pools of capital uh, were, were somewhat limited relative to, to the U.S. counterparts and that the, the, there were actually evaluation disparities uh, when looking at European biotech companies relative to their U.S. counterparts. So uh, we felt uh, that it was a good use of our time to, to come to Europe and spend time here, despite the fact that we don't have brick and mortar uh, in Europe. Um, and help advise companies on how to access pools of capital from the U.S., whether it be coming directly to the NASDAQ or uh, inspiring U.S. VCs to, to help fund clinical development and then at some point hopefully come to the NASDAQ when they're, when they're more mature. So if anyone would like to learn more about Lyric after this, I'd be happy to chat. Well, so uh, I, a few words to my background. I'm a scientist by training. I uh, was working in science until... Uh, I was 35 and then uh, moved on to consulting in the last almost 10 years now I've been investing as a venture capital investor. And um, my partner and I, we recently decided that we'd actually like to take the opportunity that uh, we think the Nordics present right now and spun out from our old firm and uh, we are starting our own venture capital firm right now here in Norway, in Oslo. Um, this is where our headquarters is based, and um, we're looking to make investments in the life science space. Uh, with respect to um, what types of companies we are looking for, uh, it's really a definition by technology or industry um, and uh, by life stage of an asset. So in terms of uh, industry, 
It would be anything that uh, creates patient benefit in an ethical way. So, in other words, in a clinical trial. So, anything that needs to go through a clinical trial, may it be a uh, medical device, may it be a drug, a diagnostic, uh, we would consider that. Um, with respect to the uh, life cycle or the development stage, it's exactly that, uh, showing in a clinical trial uh, efficaciousness. So we would go into an asset even before, um, where we have to separate between drugs and devices because they are uh, two different beasts, but uh, with drugs, we would go in preclinical and help moving into the clinic. And with devices, we would like to stay in a little longer because I think the hypothesis that devices can actually exit after uh, regulatory approval in Europe, uh, that hypothesis is proven wrong. Yeah, and I think we'll probably come back to that later when we yeah. talk about the differences between biopharma and, and medtech. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, so my name is Morten Tussing. I work at, the, uh, at Novo Seed, which is a part of Novo AS, which is uh, the holding company of Novo Nordisk and Novo Science in Denmark. So we are a, you could say, an evergreen venture company with around 45 billion euros under management. And in our part of the business, we do uh, early stage investments across Europe. So with a focus on seed and series A and series B investments, with a, I would say, primary focus on biopharma. So that's around 80, 85%. We do a little bit of med tech and we'll probably come back to the reasons why we, we don't do that much anymore. And then we also invest into an industrial biotechnology um, as we are all, all also have a strategic link to Novozymes, which is a big Danish player, which is part of uh, the umbrella of, of Novo. Uh, a little bit about myself. So I'm a scientist by training. Um, I did my thesis at uh, Novo Nordisk many years ago, but decided basically that I would like to focus more on the interception, you can say, between the science and business. So went into uh, business development consulting for a couple of years at a boutique uh, consultancy, and then moved over to technology transfer um, at the University of Hospitals uh, around uh, Copenhagen, where I was involved in starting up companies, doing license agreements, uh, doing IP work, et cetera, et cetera. So really working with the researchers to, to get stuff up and running. And then I joined the Danish pharma company uh, Lundbeck afterwards, first in three years in business development, doing standard license agreements, collaboration agreements, equity investments, and then over to M&A, where I call it the M&A side of things, where we looked at uh, primarily orphan, on orphan opportunities or orphan companies in the US as a bold on um, acquisitions. So that was a little bit about myself. Um, in terms of Novo Seeds, what we focus on is that, um, so basically we are a, a seed fund. We provide both, uh, you can say, non-dilutive and dilutive capital. So we work together with Novo Nordisk Foundation, and we have the ability to provide grants to academic researchers in the Scandinavian region, where we can give a grant for up to 3.5 million Danish kroners for academic projects where there's a commercial potential. And these are non-dilutive with no clawback, so it's basically a grant. Um, and we manage those on behalf of the Novo Nordisk Foundation so on the, on the equity side, on the investment side, we, in Europe, we have kind of a, you can say a, a dual strategy in, in Scandinavia where we are close, where we are yeah, close to the, the, to the companies. We work very actively uh, with academics, but also new companies to actually create the companies, um, which is a process that many times takes uh, at least a year or more to actually set up the company. Uh, and then in Europe, we do more later stage investments, uh, kind of Series A and Series B investments. So that's a little bit about ourselves. We have a budget of around 25 million US dollars per year and have a portfolio of 20 companies in Europe. Okay, so, um, so I think the next question, I think, Wally, you already touched a little bit upon this, but as I think maybe you can go a little bit into some of the investment criteria that you use at the Glen Rock. I mean, what is the type of companies or opportunities that you look uh, at? And maybe you can differentiate a little bit, bit between medtech and biotech or biopharma. And if you start with biopharma, we can take medtech uh, okay. later. I'll finish with that and I'll start with the criteria. That's fine. With your permission. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a saying, but uh, we greatly believe that the team is, is a crucial element. Um, Preferably a multidisciplinary team. 
And only then we go to the company. And we want to see that there is a large unmet market need, that uh, it is, uh, the solution is something that is uh, disruptive. Um, and with regards to, to, to the distinction between uh, Medtech and Biopharma, at, at, uh, when Glenrock was initiated, uh, the focus was the beginning more on Medtech. The local industry was more m historically more Medtech focused. Um, throughout the years, because of the, to the point uh, Walter mentioned, that the proof of concept requirement for buyers before they buy a Medtech company turned into proof of sale, uh, we moved more into, into the, the biopharma. And uh, I think there you can also have a liquidation event uh, at a more early stage. Today there's all these types of uh, licensing deals where, the, where there's a milestone payment based mechanism uh, which enables you to, to go through the lifetime of the company with less capital investment uh, being put in. So. And on the, the biopharma side, you, it's, it's really the opportunity to get that early exit or the inflection point that is very clear. That's what attracts you. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Okay, well, I think, so you're coming not from the VC side, but more from the investment bank side. So sure. I think maybe in the context of what kind of companies you see as the most attractive from a capital markets perspective. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the distribution of companies who are able to go to go public on the NASDAQ, it, it, you know, it skews towards earlier stage, and, and that's a function of uh, institutional investors really being comfortable with the risk of investing in pre-proof of concept companies and opportunities and, and obviously wanting to benefit from that value inflection point uh, and then, you know, really kind of sticking with it through uh, an approval. Um, commercialization is, is when uh, most young companies, if they're not partnered, get into trouble in the U.S. and, and that's a different topic. Um, but many of the things that they're looking for are, you know, obviously novel science, differentiated programs. Uh, platform technologies are highly investable, um, particularly if there's a you know one or two lead programs with a handful of programs behind that that could be potentially partnered for for non dilutive capital. Um, and you know management team is is critical. I think that um, you know having a CEO who has either roots in big pharma or has made money for investors in the past past is important. So a well known face uh, on Wall Street and in the U S is important. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I think is, is often uh, overlooked, uh, particularly in the context of European companies to, to the U companies coming to the U.S., is the KOL community uh, around um, U just really U.S. companies, and, and, and particularly in that, like we'll, we'll use oncology as an example. Um, I have a number of European clients who have great science, great technology, very nice clinical data, and have come to the U.S. to try to raise capital from, from U.S. VCs or U.S. institutions. And if, you know, a handful of, of important KOLs to that investor aren't aware of the program or the data, oftentimes that's a, a, a deal breaker. Um, so that's, that's important as well in terms of checking the boxes of what's required in the U.S. Um, there are certain therapeutic areas uh, that are, you know, quote unquote, uh, highly investable right now. So oncology, orphan diseases, specialty diseases, um, and any type of novel therapeutic modality like gene and cell therapy, uh, the microbiome, any of these novel, uh, you know, d ways of delivering uh, new technologies is, uh, is interesting. Um, and then I think the market opportunity point is one that, you know, 10 years ago, if I were advising a, a kind of, you know, pre-proof of concept company about uh, attracting capital from public institutions, you really didn't have to start thinking about a market model until you were kind of in pivotal trials, you know, two years before launch. Anymore, given the pricing uh, pressure that we're seeing in the U.S. and just the, the um, you know, the concerns around our pricing model in the U.S., younger companies uh, have to start thinking about the market model that much earlier. Um, so hiring a, a market research firm uh, probably two or three years before you otherwise would is, is often prudent just to make sure that when you get those tough questions about 
uh, how big is the market opportunity and what are the pricing dynamics, you can answer those very confidently and kind of put those issues to, to rest. And maybe you can just explain a little bit about how you work with the European companies. I guess since you're not a, a well-known name in, in Europe, how do you go about meeting new companies? And I think maybe also from a, a company perspective, you know, at what stage should a company approach Leering for considering if they're either out fundraising for VC funding from the US or considering IPO or what's a good time to kind of approach you guys? Yeah, you know, it's a, uh, so just one statistic. So since 2014, uh, there have been 11 European domicile companies who've come, private companies who've come directly to the NASDAQ and, and we've been a book runner on nine of those. Mm -hmm. So despite the fact that we're not a well-known name uh, and don't have brick and mortar in Europe, we're still very active. Um, part of the reason is that we've, you know, picked a handful of spots and had, you know, a handful of early successes in bringing companies to the NASDAQ. And, uh, you know, frankly, like in Germany, the CFO community is very tight. Uh, so we get, you know, it, we, we oftentimes are, are introduced to young companies. We have referrals through that way. France is the same way. Um, Austria, yeah, I've got clients in Spain and the UK and Switzerland. Um, working on the, the Nordic regions, obviously, which is why I'm here. Uh, but really, we kind of do it organically, coming to things like Bio Europe and Bioequity Europe and, and, and conferences uh, such as this one to try to get our name out and make introductions. We're a young private company. Um, we're actually only only 200 employees. So from our perspective, uh, the way we grow our business is really partnering with companies early on in their life cycle, helping advise them sometimes informally for a couple of years before they're ready for a bigger transaction, whether it's taking them public or helping them with a you know partner uh, partnering process uh, with Big Pharma. That's oftentimes our our first. Um, you know, entree into to working with the company and then we'll grow with them. So a, a classic example is a, in the U.S. a company called Tesoro, uh, which is a big company in the oncology space. Uh, we helped them with their private round. We weren't uh, an advisor, but we were actually an investor. So we put our own money uh, in the company and then took them public and did all their follow-ons, helped them with their convert. And we've just been a part of, of that company as they've grown up. Uh, and now it's a, you know, a, very big player in the oncology space, and that's kind of a model for how we like to do business. So partnering, you know, typically two years before our bulge bracket peers will get involved, um, and really just cultivating a relationship and, and you know, generating a, a trust at the board level uh, to where when a bigger transaction is coming, we're oftentimes the first call. And oftentimes we'll help a company navigate the, the waters of which bulge bracket uh, to use. So in Europe, we're very happy to, to kind of go to the right and be the right book runner on a deal behind companies like firms like Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, et cetera. Uh, we recognize that you know, they can be the global coordinator and that we'll be the healthcare dedicated specialist in the US uh, that knows US investors mm -hmm. better than anybody. Okay. Thank you. And I think maybe just changing uh, tracks a little bit. So, Walter, I know that uh, Haiti Ventures is out fundraising to set up a new fund, as you explained initially. So, I think maybe for the, since we are here, you know, what really made you uh, consider setting up a fund in Norway? I think what, what, what so, check the boxes from your end. Right. Yeah. So, we were working in, uh, for a global fund, making global investments from uh, New Zealand, Australia, United States, China. Um, out of a London office and um, having that geographic breadth uh, is limitation in a way that you do your sourcing in a different way than if you really have your foot on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously an opportunity but it also limits you and secondly um, we were working for a strategic fund and realizing that the best opportunities may not may just not be aligned with uh, the strategic objective of um, the company you work with or your limited partner in that case, your investor. And we saw that, um, especially the Nordic region, I think Norway is a, a front runner here, um, despite its uh, small size compared to other countries in the region. Um, there is now a persistent high level of investment in R&D, or in research, really, but also in uh, startup funding, in early stages startup funding where these projects when they are at their riskiest um, can obtain actually money to take that first step. So it's a very fertile ground, uh, but there is almost no venture capital available for these companies for later stages when they move towards the clinical phase. 
Mm -hmm. There is, I think, uh, in the Nordics, really, there are only uh, very few dedicated life science funds. And of those, several are actually with a global uh, reach and making very few to no, no investments in the region. Mm -hmm. um, so we saw that as an opportunity to um, locate ourselves in Oslo. And in terms of your sweet spot of investments when you have to set up the fund, um, what kind of opportunities would you be looking for? Yeah, so I think I touched on that earlier with respect to uh, we, uh, technology. We are, we are agnostic. Uh, as, soon, as long as it um, will be tested in a clinical trial. And that typically has the consequence that it's also reimbursed. Mm -hmm. um, not normally. Um, so we are looking for opportunities that can ethically prove that they help patients. And that drives typically value. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I'll just put my uh, noble hat on and just give a little bit of insights as to what we are looking for in, in overseas. So I think from, <clears throat> from our perspective, uh, investing in, um, in, in Europe with a geographical focus on Europe, we, we both basically are indication agnostic, so we are not really linked to Novo Nordisk or, or the other kind of, you can say, um, strategic purposes of our daughter company, so either being diabetes or obesity, which Novo Nordisk, of course, focuses on. But basically, we are here to diversify the revenue made out of Novo Nordisk into all other indications. So we have portfolio companies in oncology, in rare diseases, in medtech. So basically across the board where we see a good opportunity. I think the only, I would say, kind of high-level investment criteria that we do have is um, cost geography. It needs to be within Europe. It needs to be of a certain uh, investment ticket size. So we normally keep to, uh, you know, initial tickets going into the company around uh, or below 5 million euros. Uh, we do invest early from seed stage, but we do invest across the entire spectrum of the life cycle of the company. So we invest from setting up the company to exit all the way. Um, I think other than that, we look at good opportunities, of course, and the experienced management team is, uh, I think, a key part of the diligence that we do. And then, of course, we also, like everybody else, value inflection driven, that we need to see the company or the program going from, from point A to point B with some activities that we can understand and appreciate and will provide a meaningful kind of uh, value for patients uh, in the end. So that's really what, what drives our interests. I think from a kind of from a academ academic perspective, we are also very interested in working together with academic groups uh, in Scandinavia broadly due to um, the availability of these non-dilutive grants that we manage on behalf of the Novo Nordisk Foundation. So if there are any people uh, that you know of or in the audience that have good ideas for, for projects, please uh, let me know and I'll, we can do our best to kind of facilitate the process on our end. So I think that's another part where we spend a lot of, lot of time, basically. So maybe there's one point to touch on, uh, which is the experience team, which obviously is something that uh, we all look for and we hardly ever find. <laughs> um, many of these assets that we see do not have um, a team that has done this three times before. I think this is maybe a, a specificity or a very specific for Europe, maybe different in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, that you have these um, successful entrepreneurs that have developed life science products twice before successfully mm -hmm. and then go back and start over again just because they're entrepreneurial. I can also admit from my scientific uh, life, my previous life, that um, there, wasn't much, there wasn't much entrepreneurial spirit. So I think uh, back then, and I think it's changing mm -hmm. quite a bit right now, uh, but I think still uh, those three times around uh, experienced CEOs don't exist here, or very rarely exist. And um, it's, uh, I think, a value driver that the fund actually has to deliver mm -hmm. or the investor has to deliver um, here in, the, in Europe. I don't think it's specific for the Nordics. Mm -hmm. and as well, maybe you have your, your own experiences being... Um, well, I think that, you know, frankly, our experiences in the U.S., there's a, particularly in Cambridge and, and, you know, San Francisco, Palo Alto, there's an ecosystem there where, um, you know, many of these successful CEOs kind of get recycled back in, you know, they've got VC relationships, and then before you know it, they pop up uh, as a CEO of another kind of emerging growth company. Um, Europe, it's been, our experience has been, it's typically an entrepreneurial former scientist uh, has an idea, pulls an asset out of academia or big pharma, 
Um, and oftentimes, you know, it's, it's uh, high net worth backed and it's a kind of first time CEO. Um, so it does require a little bit more um, cultivating in terms of making sure that they're, they're in front of the right people to, to earn the, the trust, uh, the trust and, uh, of, of U.S. investors. But um, I, I do, I, I think that's changing though. I do, I do agree that uh, particularly in France uh, and Germany and, and, um, and the UK, there are now CEOs who've kind of started and sold companies and now, you know, coming back for a second, a second go, if you will. I think Asaf also in Israel, what is your experience on this? We, by the way, face the, the, the same challenge at the beginning uh, of the local life science industry day. You had uh, a lot of scientists with brilliant idea, but without any management experience. So uh, throughout the years, what turned out to be is that, first of all, when the multinationals starting to come, they provide the, the, the people with the skills which they need. And in addition, you see people coming back from, from the States or from uh, working in uh, Europe and, and bringing their skill set. So it's something that will evolve uh, through time and uh, it happened then and I'm, I can imagine it will happen here uh, as well. I think we may have a question from the audience, is that correct? No, no, it's fine, it's fine. It's more interactive, the better. So, um, Henrik Lund, Oslo Cancer Cluster, we have about 50 uh, member companies and about 20, 30 hospitals and academia institutions. My, my question is related to what you started, where the medtech pharma distinctions in, in, in investment. Um, if you are investing along the value chain from preclinical and phase one, phase two, et cetera, and hoping for an, an exit also during that phase, um, wouldn't you also carry with you the intrinsic risk that is associated that pharma actually had in these phases that were above 80% if you go to phase one, et cetera. So my question really comes to the point that even though your business model opposite the old pharma model is much more screening feasibility and uh, selection of companies up front, if you are in biopharma, are you more successful than those horrendous failure rates coming out of Tuft University that's related to phases, et cetera. That's covering everything. But you're looking at smaller companies and these statistics were actually driven from, you know, rather big sized companies trying to, to get their product through. So my question in essence, what's your failure rate <laughs> in your portfolio? Sure. Because when I hear that you are looking for teams that have done successful product development in life science three times, come on. I mean, we had people in, in AstraZeneca where I was working, their whole life was spent in misery and no <laughs> successful company. <laughs> so, I mean, where do you find these wonderful three times? Does it really exist? And what's your failure rate in your portfolio? I think I can just give a very short uh, comment to that and then I'll let the, the panel explain. So, uh, I joined Noble quite recently, like a, a year ago. So, I, I haven't been in the VC, on the VC side of things for that long. So, I, I used to be in, in pharma before working in portfolio management of a Danish pharma company. So it's totally correct that you know, a there's a lot of attrition in the pipeline, but I do also see a lot of differences between the pharma R&D model and the VC way of doing things, because I think there's a inertia in pharma in the sense that people try to kind of uh, have the program stay alive for a very long time because basically they're associated with one program. And I think that's where the, the VC, when the VCs gets in, they're a lot more tough on the programs, right? If you don't deliver, we close down the company. It's a, I think it's a, it's a bit of a tougher world in that sense. But I'll, any comments from uh, Walter? Or so it's, I guess it's hard for a single individual to make a statistic on that, that you know, has any value. Um, so there has to be some, some uh, confidence that the personal experience is actually reproducible. Uh, but having said that, I think that I completely agree. Pharma has a, probably a different approach to uh, selecting their assets. And I've worked for a corporate fund. They have selected assets and let assets go because of their strategic decisions. And secondly, um, I think um, 
to be in VC, you have to, you have to know how to operate with risk and not like it. So um, that means that you try to get away from, end, from the, that you reduce the risk wherever it is, and that starts very much at the selection. And I think one of the questions that we discussed earlier that we're going to touch on to, and maybe that you know, leads to that conversation, was um, uh, your success cases. And I can tell you, the, the most successful companies that we have seen had a very, very basic technology that was just natural. It had to work. I mean, obviously, it could have been wrong, right? There's, even if there's a 5% chance to fail, for something to fail, those 5% happen in 100 cases. So I'm not saying that's not the case, but um, the technologies that were the biggest successes, uh, they were very simple, very low risk, maybe not the sexiest, maybe not that new mode of action that Pfizer is, is, is looking for right now, but it worked. And there was such a rationale for no safety problems, and there were no safety problems. So I think it's in the picking. You pick not by a strategic guidelines, you pick by does this really, um, does it really lie on the right side of the risk return curve? And then you just have to accept that there, if you do a large number, there is a, going to be a failure rate. David? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I do think that there's a trend in, in the venture community in the U.S. where a lot of these firms like a flag, flagship, Third Rock, Arch, et cetera, are founding companies uh, on their own. So seeding them, founding them, pulling assets out of academia, and then putting them through a, a very rigorous, you know, test, stress test, you know, trying to find ways, ways to make the molecule fail. And once it kind of holds up, and, and from their, their perspective, forcing these things to fail early is, is, you know, very productive. And then once something doesn't fail, then they'll put a Series A in place. They'll lead that round as an anchor investor, bring a couple friends on board, and bring a seasoned CEO and put that person in the seat. Oftentimes someone who's an uh, entrepreneur in residence or someone who's taken a um, flagship or third rock company public and sold that company so that that's the model uh, not for everyone but that is a model that we're seeing kind of play out more and more and even some of the less well-known venture firms are, are trying to replicate that as well yeah. um, so I think all the failures that you're talking about are, are oftentimes not seen by the public that said uh, we did an analysis uh, about just drug failures in biotech and pharma looking at 14, 15, and 16. and 16, there were an outsized number of failures relative to the prior two years. Um, and, you know, many of these companies were public at the time, companies that, frankly, we had taken public in 14 and 15. So all of that was playing out in the public markets and on a public stage, and that created some of the uh, headwinds that we saw in biotech in 16. Um, so it's interesting. I think that despite the fact that VCs are trying to, you know, force these companies to fail early uh, so they don't have to spend 50, 60, 100 million dollars on a program, we're still seeing companies get out and fail, you know, have nice phase 2B, data, phase 2B data that doesn't translate to phase 3 and fail in a very public way. Thanks. Do we have any? Yeah, maybe a question also from the um, medtech background um, on the success and failure rate uh, specifically also with the time to market. Um, my company for 11 years helps, for instance, U.S. startups and Israeli startups to develop and commercialize in Germany. And the key advantage we see, and we figured it out in the first three years of trial error, was to include um, the talents and R&D centers in Israel and in Germany, uh, in, in Israel and in the United States, but leveraging on the opportunity with German university, uh, university hospitals and stakeholders. So on one component, to have the medical and scientific background, accompanied by seasoned uh, and experienced uh, consultant and business manager to translate the scientific benefit into economic advantage also through cost-benefit analysis. And what we figured out was that multinationals, for instance, Philips, Hollister's, and others, benefited from this by acquiring a technology and assessing it because you have it inside the hospital, first of all, in a beta test scenario, and in a second step, once clinical evidence is proven, certification is given, and also cost benefit has been demonstrated to third payer parties to acquire these companies and you know, close these barriers much faster. So the question is also from my side in the VC world, do you see this as a beneficial trend to integrate opportunities or uh, uh, scenarios like this in a 
earlier stage, as you said, seasoned CEOs in Silicon Valley jump from one company to the others. Um, and I think that this could be a way also how to drive forward innovation itself while the multinationals, as you said, look for the commercialization. I think this was uh, named. So at a specific point of time, the companies are experts in developing, but then giving the you know, commercial development and strategic development in the hands of experienced uh, senior advisors and partners. I think, the, I think we have one minute left or so, so I don't know who want to take the, uh, the answer. First of all, I just want to say that it's not the, the, the success rate, it's how big are the successes. That's, that's the idea in, uh, in VC investment, yes? So when you have a success, it's supposed to, of course, uh, compensate for the, for the losses. Um, I, I would like to, to just uh, touch on uh, also on Walter's point about basic technologies. And when you take them, we had, uh, we had a very successful company with a basic purification technology of uh, proteins. When you take them to the high end, it's also something high end products. Now, uh, often drug uh, it is developing. It often takes a lot of the risk out also. And uh, of course, I, I truly agree with uh, the point you made. It's very valid, and I think it's a, it's a great uh, way to also to evaluate risk. Yeah. Okay, I think we uh, the time's up, so I think we have to uh, to wrap up. But thanks very much for your attention, and uh, wish you a continued good conference.